in the arena with Monsignor Kieran Harrington. Call in at 347-921-4NET. 347-921-4NET. Hey, gang, welcome back to In the Arena. My name is Monsignor Kieran Harrington. Edgaro Mortara was a, a little boy uh, born to a Jewish family who uh, was baptized by a Catholic nurse. He was taken from his family when he was about six years old uh, and brought to a boarding school where he was then raised as a Catholic and ultimately was to become a, a Catholic priest. Uh, and the title of the book is Kidnapped by the Vatican. Thanks very much for being with us, Roy Shoman, for telling us the story. Sure. By the way, um, at the risk of being pedantic, it's kidnapped by the Vatican question mark ah, okay. because the author is really very critical of the claim that he was kidnapped by the, by the Vatican. Vatican. Tell us a little bit about this story. Sure. Um, it's probably hard for us to really uh, put ourselves back into that period of time, but we are talking about when the Papal States still existed as a sovereign country, where the temporal ruler of the Papal States was the Pope, and where it was very much a confessional state, where not only was church and state not separated, but it was unthinkable. It was thought at that time to be completely inappropriate for church and state to be separated. Uh, there was a law in the Papal States at the time that any baptized Christian child had to be given a Christian education. And what happened, as you introduced it, was that this little boy, uh, infant at the time, at Gardo Mortaro, when he was just a few months old, was at the point of death, and the Jewish family, who lived in Bologna, which was one of the papal states at the time, um, surreptitiously baptized him at the point of death. He perhaps miraculously recovered. And then a few years later, when the boy was six, um, she ended up telling the story uh, to a priest who then told her that she had to report it to the authorities. She reported it to the authorities. And at that point, the authorities, uh, which were the authorities of the Pope, essentially, uh, went to the family and said, you know, unfortunately, the child is actually a baptized Catholic, and the baptism was valid, if not licit. So he falls under the requirement that he must be given a Christian education. The family refused, and in order to enforce that law, Pius IX, who was the Pope at the time, ordered the papal police to remove the child from the family, take him to uh, the House of Catechumens in Rome, which was a facility for Jewish uh, Jews who were on the road to becoming Catholic. Mm -hmm. And he was then raised as a kind of ward of Pope Pius IX. Well, explain uh, that relationship between uh, Egaro and Pope Pius IX. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly loving and devoted on both ends. Um, Pope Pius IX treated him like a son, and Edgardo um, couldn't mention Pope Pius IX's name without tears. At one point, when Edgardo was in the seminary and Pope Pius IX came on a visit, not to Edgardo, but to the seminarians, Edgardo uh, threw himself at the Pope's feet and bathed them with you know, tears and kisses and so forth. And Edgardo consistently throughout his life um, firmly asserted that Pius IX was a saint and would someday be canonized. Was he ever reunited with his family? Um, his family had visitation rights, limited visitation rights. He had a few visits uh, to his family from his family in the course of um, you know, going from six years old to uh, I don't know what, probably late teens, uh, early 20s. Yeah. Um, he had to leave Italy w when he got ordained because this was this was a huge cause celebre. I mean, uh, this was in the newspapers throughout the world, the United States and all the countries of Europe. When he was taken I, from the family or when he became a priest? No, what, that he was the, the case of him being, quote, kidnapped yes. by the Vatican. So it was in all the newspapers everywhere? For decades. Okay. Or for, uh, certainly for years, but uh, it's effect, it's effect, it had the direct effect of the Pope losing the Papal States. Yeah. There, it is absolutely historically establishable that the Pope would not have lost the Papal States, I think it was in 1861, if it had not been for the Mortara case. So, so um, tell us a little bit about, uh, if he, if, why, would, why would he lose contact? If he was able to keep in contact with his family, 
what was his relationship with his own parents as he grew older? Um, it was, I mean, he, he it was very loving, but it was difficult and it was uh, somewhat distant in some ways. And um, he was actually, he had to be careful about contact with his family because there were attempts to kidnap him, to kidnap him back. from yeah. back, yes. Right. And in fact, at one point, uh, revolutionaries, because the context of this is, I see, I don't want to get to, in too much into history that people aren't familiar with, but was the Risorgimento, was, mm. was the unification of Italy as, as the Republic of Italy, which took place during this time. So it was a, a period of revolution where there were these continual rebellions and revolts in the various independent kingdoms, city-states of Italy. And at one point, the revolutionaries actually uh, uh, liberated uh, Edgardo from his captivity and ordered him kind of to go back to his family. And uh, he fled and hid to keep from being forced to go back to his family because he basically, because he was completely devoted as a, um, you know, as a Catholic and he didn't want to lose his, his, uh, his Christian but religion. Roy, this sounds a little bit like Stockholm Syndrome, doesn't it? May I read his words yes. about this, this poor Stockholm victim? Um, how can I explain the explosion of Christian sentiment in my mind immediately after receiving the first ideas about the faith? Remember, he's about six years old at the time. No sooner was I instructed in the rudiments of the catechism then I adhere to the Catholic Church into her head with a strength and a tenacity that nothing has been able to shake or conquer. There are, you're right. There are only two explanations. Uh, for a secular atheist, they're going to say it was an incredibly extreme case of Stockholm Syndrome. But from um, with, with the eyes of faith, it's evident that his faith was completely supernatural. So let's talk about uh, relevance today. Uh, what's the relevance of this case today? And it seems that uh, Steven Spielberg is actually going to be working on a movie about this case. So what do you think is the relevance today and what can we expect from the Spielberg film? I would say the relevance today is that the Mortara case back in 1858 was used for church bashing. And its relevance today is it's still available for use for mm. church batching. And that's what you think it will be? I am sure that's why Spielberg is making the movie. Um, I, I think that this, this was an incredibly well-known case and famous uh, at the time. And, you know, in the second half of the 19th century, as I said, it resulted in the loss of the Papal States. Um, but it's been largely forgotten now, so it's there on the shelf to be resuscitated to have yet another round of church back. So how do you square the, uh, how, but how will that story square with the words of Mortara himself? They're not going to give the words of Mortara. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Pius IX. I mean, Pius IX is a huge figure and uh, and he was a uh, fought against modernism. The world was radically changing uh, as Pius IX was. Why would Pius IX, was it his arrogance? What was it about him? that he would refuse to even uh, listen to the pressure that was coming to him oh, about he this listened, case. He listened to the pressure, and he knew about the pressure, and he was actually aware that if he stood firm and did not return this child to his Jewish family, the uh, result might be losing the papal states. He was fully aware of that. Um, he, he um, at the time... That's an, uh, that's an important point. So you think that Pius IX knew if he does not return... Edgardo, he loses the Papal States, and still he maintains, he, he still allows the child to remain at this uh, and be catechized and go to school and that sort of thing. There's absolutely no question, because he said it himself in his own words, that he was aware of the implications of what he was doing. Um, uh, he, he, for instance, see, in 1848, uh, he lost the Papal States for the first time. There was a, a revolt. Right. Uh, Garibaldi and Massini, and he, uh, most of the papal states succumbed to the revolt, and they were made independent republics, and Rome was made an independent republic, and the Pope had to flee Rome in disguise mm -hmm. and hide out. And then uh, he managed to get back the papal states with the aid of the Austrian and French troops, mm -hmm. because, of course, at the time, I mean, this was still the remnants of the Holy Roman, Roman Empire, Empire right. 
Austria was very Catholic, France was still ambiguously Catholic, and they lent their troops, because of course he didn't have troops that could really compete, for regaining the Papal States. So his sovereignty was dependent on the goodwill of the French and, and Austrian governments. When this case came out, um, there was a tremendous outcry in all of um, Enlightenment Europe against the Pope having taken this child from his family. And as a result, both the Austrian government and the French government, I mean, they had ambassadors, of course, to the Papal States, you know, met with the Pope and said, you know, you're going to have to return the child. Um, the, um, uh, let me see if I, if I easily or, or quickly can find the, um, the, the quote. Um, here's what he said to the French ambassador. This is what Pius IX said to the French ambassador when the ambassador basically told him that he risked losing the support of the French troops if, if he didn't return the child. The boy, the Pope said, quote, pleaded that he be allowed to remain Christian and not be made to leave the church. It is impossible for the head of this church, for the representative of Jesus Christ on earth, to refuse this child, for he begged me with an almost supernatural faith to let him share in the benefit of the blood that our Lord shed for his redemption. It is impossible to eject from Christianity this soul who, although entering the Catholic faith through irregular means, does not want to leave it. I have reflected at great length and with great pain about the extent of my obligations. I have asked for illumination from heaven to make my conscience clear. My decision is irrevocable. By the grace of God, I have seen my duty, and I would rather cut off all my fingers than shrink from it. So there you have it. Those are the words of Pius IX. Roy, just one last question. We have a few seconds left, um, but uh, I just want to hear your thoughts. You're a Jewish convert yourself. So how does this story resonate with you? Um, I, uh, boy, um, uh, I feel, I mean, you know, I obviously, ha I hope, have this supernatural view coming from the faith. I, I feel for the family, um, but I also um, feel for the grace that was showered on, on Edgardo and for him enjoying what he somewhat irregularly came into. But the reason this is of so much interest to me is because, in a way, it encapsulates my life. Because what's interesting about this situation is it's either black or white. And if from the views within the faith, you've got a real black and white case, I believe. Yeah. And from the view of somebody who doesn't have the faith, it's black and white in the opposite direction. And there's no room for negotiation or compromise. I just have to press one more point. I mean, Roy, when you consider uh, the history of the Jewish people and the persecutions and the pogroms and every uh, when you consider all of that, I mean, what does this doesn't this story seem to epitomize all that was terrible that was inflicted upon the Jewish people? I, excuse me for saying it, but that statement is from the perspective of not knowing how bad it really was, because when you know how bad that persecution really was through the centuries, this is a drop is not even a drop in the bucket. Yeah. I mean, it was so bad and so heavy-handed um, that uh, you, this is already the very tail end of it. So, you know, if I want to make a, a pope into a villain for his persecution of the Jews, they're much better candidates than Pius IX. Roy Shoman, he wrote the foreword for the book Kidnapped by the Vatican, question uh, mark, a book about the story, the unpublished memoirs of Edgardo Mortara. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you.